We're gonna tie a stimulator now. This is a great attractor dry, very buoyant fly, useful in a dry dropper situation. You can match a caddis, a stonefly, a hopper. Uh, very visible fly, very bushy. Float through the roughest water, and it takes some pretty picky fish as well. Um, pretty basic set of tying techniques for this fly. There is a few little tricks for tying in the wing and for doing the underbody, so we're gonna walk through those a little more specifically when we get to them. Uh, but this fly is really just a compilation of other parts that we've already done. We're going to tie this fly on a, on a Tiemco 5212. That's a two extra long dry fly hook. So it's a light wire hook, but a longer shank than usual. Uh, this lighter wire hook will help the fly float a little bit better, set it up higher in the water column. The tail is going to be yearling elk. The wing is going to be the same piece of yearling elk as well. Our abdomen is going to be yellow, super or yellow antron dubbing. Our thorax is going to be hot orange antron dubbing. And we're going to palmer a brown hackle over the abdomen with a grizzly hackle over the thorax. We're going to use some copper wire as a rib. And we're going to use our thread as some accents along the way. So to get started, I'm going to start the thread right about the midpoint on the hook. And I'm going to wrap back to the bend. I want to get right back to the apex of the bend, right where the, the bend of the hook and the shank come together, right at that point where they butt together. I'm going to build a little nub of thread to make a little ball here. And what this little nub is going to do is two things. It's going to make a little hot spot that can imitate an egg sac or just an attractor spot on the fly, as well as help to spread the tail out, make it get a little more surface area out of the hair. Um, it also is particularly helpful when you're fishing a dropper off this fly. It keeps the back end of the fly from sinking down. So I've just built a little nub of thread there. Now we're going to use some of this yearling elk for the tail. And I like the yearling elk because it's, it's much more similar to deer hair than elk hair, although it's very durable like elk hair would be. I'm going to hold the very tips of this clump of hair and pull all the under fur out and all the short hairs. And I'll stack this clump of hair up in my stacker. I've got a smaller bunch of hair here, so I'm using my smaller diameter stacker. Just keeps the hair a little more upright, so it stacks a little more evenly. Um, if you take a small clump of hair and put it in the bigger stacker, it can lay at an angle through the inside of the tube, and it won't come out stacked. It'll come out at an angle. So I like to use the smaller stacker for the smaller bunches. And you can see how that's come out nice and even and square on the ends. I always go through the bunch of hair just to make sure there's no broken tips in there, and I've got just a couple here. I'm going to separate those and thin this bunch down just a bit. And I'll take my stacked clump of hair and I'm going to measure it against the hook gap. In this case, with this two extra long hook, our shank doesn't give us a whole lot of reference points. So we're going to use the hook gap as the measurement. We want the tail to be about a hook gap long. It can be slightly longer, but somewhere right around the hook gap distance long. I'm going to bundle this hair up. And before I go to tie this hair in, I'm going to spin my bobbin. We're using 70 denier fire orange thread. And the 70 denier UTC thread is very flat. So I'm going to spin it a bit so it'll help bite into this hair as I tie it down inching my way forward to anchor that hair in place. Now I can let go of the tail, and you can see I've got a nice little bundle tail right on top of the hook. Now I'm going to lift all these butt ends up and work my thread back up to about the 50-50 point. Now ultimately, there's a little trick on what we're about to do here. We want to tie these butt ends off at about the 60-40 point. These are going to become the underbody for our abdomen. But if I were to tie these off right at the 60-40 point, I'm going to have some stubs left from where I trim the butt ends. So I'm going to leave my thread hanging right at that 50-50 point. So that starting point with the thread was important. So make sure you're right in the middle of the hook. I'm now going to take this hair and lay it down again, bring the thread up and over it a couple times at the 50-50 point, and cinch that down in place. When I pull these butt ends up to trim them, and the easiest way to do this is close your fingers under the hook and lift them above, I'm going to have some little stubs left. And that's going to creep forward that other 10%. That's always going to happen. You're always going to have a stub that is as wide as your scissor blade is long. The scissor blade cuts at the center of the two blades, so as close as you can get is the blade width. So just keep that in mind as you go to cut materials. You need to kind of pre-plan things a little bit so that you don't end up with butt ends that stick further forward than you had planned. What we've also done here is we built an elk hair underbody. That's going to do two things. It's going to build some flotation into the fly. It's also going to build up a little bit of volume on the hook so we don't have to use so much dubbing to build the body on this larger size fly. Now I'm going to spiral wrap my thread back over that elk hair. And the reason I spiral wrap is so I don't compress it all. I want to leave some of that volume there. That's going to keep with the floating and also keep that volume there where we're going to build up our dubbing on top. Now, as I come back to this band of thread where we anchored the tail, I'm going to lift the tail up and hold onto it in my fingers. And with that same short working thread, I'm going to put one turn behind the other and really wedge that tail up against the base of that nub. And you can see that spreads that tail out, gives it a little more surface area. 
Surface area is what makes flies float. So we've got that hair tied in. Now we're going to tie in a piece of copper wire for our rib. Now my thread's hanging at the bin, so what I'm going to do is take this piece of wire and tie it in right at the bin. And you can see the stub into the wire extends just about to the end of that underbody. So I'm going to anchor that down tightly at the bin, and then I can spiral forward over it to the front. So we've just done the same move we've done several times, just from the back this time, rather than from the front to the back, we went from the back to the front. Now we're going to dub our abdomen. We're going to use some yellow Antron dubbing. And the reason I use the Antron dubbing is you can see it's really bright and shiny. It's a little slicker than most other dubbings, so it's a little harder to work with, but those bright colors really accentuate a fly like this. I'm going to draw out a length of thread. This is a long fiber dubbing, so it really feeds onto the thread well. You can see how I can really draw it out easily. And we're tying a big fly here. So we'll probably need a little more dubbing than this, but we'll come back and reapply once we go. I'm going to set my hook down in the vise here a little bit. I'm going to use this bare thread between the dubbing and the hook to work back to get my first turn of dubbing at the bend. And I'll work forward from there, just making a nice smooth first layer of dubbing coming forward on the hook. If I need to retighten my dubbing, I can kind of pinch it as I go along. You can see the little orange orange thread shown at the front of the body from where we tied the butt ends off. We don't want to go off that shoulder. We want to leave that edge bare for right now. I'll work back with the second layer of dubbing, just starting to work on my taper a bit. Just as I run out of dubbing, I'm going to be back down on bare hook again. One little strand. So we've got a nice tapered abdomen. Now we're going to tie in our hackle feather. Now we're tying on a size 8 hook, but I've got about a size, oh, 12 or 14 feather. And the reason is, is I don't want these hackle fibers as I bend them around the hook. I don't want them to extend way past the hook point. The other thing is, is we're now palmering this feather over this much thicker body diameter rather than the bare shank. You can see when I measure this feather on the bare shank, it's well inside the hook gap. When I put it back here, it's well outside the hook gap. So their feather will grow depending on how big the diameter of the hook that you're wrapping on. And in this case, with the, with the heavily dubbed body, we've got a lot more volume there. So I've got an undersized feather for the hook, but it's going to come out about right. I'm going to strip a little bit of the fibers off the butt end of this feather. And before I tie it in, I want to make a thread base all the way up to the hook eye and back again one more time, just so that we're not tying to bare metal. I'll tie this feather in right at the front edge of the body, and I've got a little exposed stem for that first turn. And I've got the inside of the feather facing toward the body of the fly. Now I'm going to spiral wrap this feather back over the body with nice evenly spaced turns to the bend. When I get there, I'll pick up my wire and trap the tip of the feather and spiral wrap the wire forward over the hackle just in nice evenly spaced turns just as we did the hackle. The whole trick to wrapping that wire through the hackle is your, your hackle will be wrapped back to the bend at a set angle. Your wire wants to be at the exact opposite angle coming forward and that helps you keep from trapping anything down as you go. But you can see we end up with a nice bushy body. That yellow still shows through. We've got plenty of surface area on the fly to help with the float. So I'm going to trim out our hackle feather, get a couple more turns on my wire, and I can snap off that fine wire. And now I'm ready to tie my wing in. This is going to be a little bit different than most uh, conventional directions for this fly, because we're going to tie in a relatively heavy wing on this fly, but we don't want to create a ton of bulk, or we want to control where that bulk goes. So I'm going to take some yearling elk, and it's a little bit more than what we used for the tail, but it's not a whole lot. It's going to be a longer wing, but it's not really that much more hair. So I want to make sure I get this all cleaned out. All the under fur, all the short hairs, anything that's extra long or broken tips, we want to clean out. I'm going to leave this wing a little heavy just to illustrate the point of how we're going to tie this down. I'll put this in my stacker and stack them up. to a nice even bundle like this. The wing length on a stimulator is sort of open to interpretation. Anywhere between the tie-in point, which is where my thread's hanging, the tips can come to the base of the tail or the end of the tail. Anywhere in between there is okay. 
I tend to make small flies with a shorter wing. It just keeps the overall profile a little smaller. And bigger flies with a longer wing. It adds more float to those harder to float large patterns. So on this fly, this being a size 8, I'm going to shoot toward the end of the tail here. And before I go to tie this in, I'm going to spin my thread up a bit. Again, just to cord it so it'll bite into this hair and help anchor it down tightly to the hook. I'm going to set this hair in. I'll pinch it in place. I've got the hook shank and the hair in my fingertips. I'm going to put two turns around the hair and tighten the thread toward me. Now, we've got the larger diameter butts. Even though we don't have that much more hair than we had on the tail, we're on the larger diameter butt. So this hair is not going to completely compress with these first two turns. I've got those two turns on there, and you can see I can kind of work that a little bit and move those hairs still. But there's no way I can get all that hair bound down with just a few turns of thread without creating a lot of bulk. What I'm going to do is I'm going to work my thread forward through these butt ends, keeping the thread tight all the way around the hook as I work forward. And as I do that, the, the hairs will distribute around the hook and be tied down almost individually. So rather than tying 100 hairs down with two wraps of thread, I've got 100 hairs with two wraps of thread, and 80, thread, 80 hairs with two more wraps of thread, and 60 hairs with two more. And we've just distributed that bulk all the way around the hook shank. The other advantage of tying the wing this way is all those butt ends are now all the way around the hook, rather than all being piled on top. If we had tied these like a caddis wing and tried to trim them off on top of the hook, we'd have a big step and a big difference between the diameter on top of the hook and the bottom. So to help keep, th keep things centered, we're going to distribute those butt ends like we've done here. Now, to trim these butts, it's going to take two maneuvers. I'm going to grab the top of this hair, as much of it as I can, and I'll come in and trim that off as close as I can get. Then I'm going to lift my thread up and grab this hair. Um, typically, I'll do this from the other side, like so, so I can hold my thread out of the way as I come in from the bottom with my scissors and trim those hairs off. Now, in the event that you break your thread or cut your thread when you do that, don't worry, it's not going to go anywhere. I lost a couple turns there, but that thread is all bound down inside those hair butts, so it's not going to blow up. If you're trimming the hair and you trim your thread by accident, just set your thread aside, finish your trim job, and then you can come in and reapply your thread right on top. It's not the end of the world. We'll get rid of that little tag end. Now I'm going to come back up, and you can see our butt ends are sort of distributed into, into a little cone here at the front of the fly. I'm going to wrap over those. I'm not going to try to cover every one of them, but I do want to smooth it off a bit. And I'm just going to push one turn right behind the other, forcing that wing right up to the front edge of the abdomen. That'll stand it up a little bit, and that moves very similar to what we did with the nub of thread at the back and the tail. We're just going to prop that wing up, and you can see how that creates a little more surface area on the hair wing. All right, we're almost done. We're going to tie in our grizzly hackle feather here for the front of the fly. And for our grizzly feather, we want it at least the same size as our brown feather, if not slightly bigger. But we definitely don't want it any smaller. If we've got a smaller hackle on the front of the fly, this fly will tend to float on its nose. So we want to make sure that this hackle's at least the same size as the brown, if not bigger. It's a little bigger than the brown right now, and we don't have any dubbing on there. So I know this feather's safe. I'm going to trim the butt end off and strip just a few fibers off the base of this feather. And I'll tie this in right at the base of the wing. Several tight turns of thread. I want to make sure that this is anchored down tightly. And now I'll dub our thorax. Now, this is a lot like the other flies that we've done so far in that we've got a taper that runs down toward the hook eye. And by now we've learned that we've got to dub up that hill rather than from the base of the wing forward. So I'm going to apply some dubbing to the thread here. And a relatively heavy strand, I'm starting to slide this long hook out of my jaws. Relatively heavy strand. We've got not quite a half a shank length worth of hook here. But I want to start this dubbing just behind the index point. I want to leave room for a thread head. So I'm going to start this dubbing just behind the index point. I'm going to work it up to the base of the wing. You can see I'm kind of building a cone shape there. And when I get to the base of the wing, you can see those last two wraps sort of group the wing together. That cushion thread with the dubbing on it will start, sort of group the hair together without flaring it out. Now you can see I've still got that taper. I want to square this thorax off a bit. So when I get to the front, I'm going to make a couple extra turns to square that dubbing off where I've got a little bit more blocky shaped thorax. Now I can palmer my grizzly feather forward over the thorax. So I'm going to start this first turn with the outside of the feather facing forward right at the front edge of the wing. And I'll just make evenly spaced turns through that dubbing right up onto the bare shank at the front. I'll lift the feather above the hook, tie it off with a couple of turns, come in and trim that feather out. I'll sort of sweep everything back just to clear the way 
to make a nice neat thread head here. I'm going to cover all those butt ends and then I'll come in and whip finish. I try to make the thread head as prominent as the orange butt end on the back end so it is a part of the fly. I don't like a tiny little thread head on a big fly like this. Those little hot spots are sort of attractive to the fish. It can make, make them catch a little more attention. Um, at least that's my belief, but that's why I do that. Makes the fly a little more symmetrical as well. That's a stimulator. You can tie this in a hundred different colors. Match all kinds of different bugs. Olive, all black, all yellow, all orange. Uh, much bigger sizes, much smaller sizes. Really a versatile fly. A great summertime attractive guy.